to ELA grade 10 for the week of June 8th. This lesson segment will cover lesson one and two. In lesson one, you will review a passage from Why Read Shakespeare in order to draft an argumentative essay in response to Michael Mack's central claim. Take a moment to think about the following questions. In what ways are the works of Shakespeare, although written hundreds of years ago, still relevant and applicable to our lives now? What aspects of the human condition are explored and commented on in Shakespeare's plays and sonnets? So let's take a brief trip down memory lane and think about some of the themes that Shakespeare explores in Macbeth. So first we have ambition. You analyzed ambition in detail over these last few weeks, so you should have a pretty solid understanding of the way that Shakespeare developed the theme and the comments that he's making about ambition. We also have loyalty and betrayal, which is exemplified by the numerous ways that we see Macbeth betraying those we think a noble man should be loyal to. And we also have fate versus free will. We see this in the inclusion of the visions from the three witches, which leaves readers to wonder if Macbeth's downfall was of his own doing or if it was fated. Now think back to Romeo and Juliet. You may remember the following theme topics, love, family loyalty, and fate versus free will. Notice how some of these theme topics overlap with Macbeth. What might that say about Shakespeare's work? How do these topics relate to the universal human experience? So now let's consider the flip side of this question. In what ways are Shakespeare's works irrelevant and not applicable to our lives now? After all, they were written hundreds of years ago. Keep these thoughts in mind, both about the relevancy and irrelevancy of Shakespeare's works as we continue through the remainder of this lesson. <clears throat> In lesson one, on the week of May 11th, you read the speech, Why Read Shakespeare? And you evaluated the degree to which the author successfully convinces his audience to read Shakespeare. Today, you'll reread a short selection from Why Read Shakespeare and review the way the author develops his central claim that through the reading of Shakespeare, individuals learn about themselves and the world. Let's take a look at the passage together. I'll read aloud as you read on your own. As we're reading, annotate your text to analyze the way that the author, Michael Mack, develops his central claim. What reasons does he offer? What evidence? <clears throat> In Shakespeare's time, great books were thought of as mirrors. When you read a great book, the idea is you are looking into a mirror a pretty special mirror, one that reflects the world in a way that allows us to see its true nature. What is more, as we hold the volume of Shakespeare in front of us, we see that it reflects not only the world around us, but also ourselves. What is it that we find in Shakespeare? Nothing less than ourselves and the world, certainly worthy subjects to study in college. In the case of Macbeth, we have a supreme reflection of ambition. But what makes the play terrifying is not that Macbeth looks like a fascist dictator, a popular staging these days, but because he looks like us. If you don't see your own overreaching in the phantasmagoric, restless ecstasy of Macbeth, you need to read again. Either you don't understand the true nature of Macbeth's ambition, or you don't know yourself, or quite possibly both. What we see in these examples is a fairly complex interplay of life and literature. Literature teaches you about life, and the better you understand literature, the better you understand life. It is also true, though, that the more you know about life, the better equipped you are to understand what you find in literature. This two-way mirroring means that learning about literature and learning about life go hand in hand. And it means that finding beauty and meaning in Shakespeare is a sort of proving ground for finding beauty and meaning in life. Indeed, as you learn to read Shakespeare, you are learning to read the world. As you interpret Shakespeare's characters, you are practicing figuring out life's characters. Struggling with the complexities involved in interpreting Shakespeare 
is a superb preparation for struggling with the complexities of life. Shakespeare offers a world of vicarious experience, a virtual reality, a sort of flight simulator that gives you a great advantage when it comes time to venture out into the real world. So Shakespeare isn't just for the literary types. He is for anyone who is interested in navigating the real world. Take a moment to review your annotations and consider the reasons and evidence Michael Mack offers to develop his claim. Now that we've read the text and you've made your annotations, we will plan out your argument end of unit essay. You will construct a claim in response to the following prompt. Mack asserts that through the reading of Shakespeare, individuals learn about themselves and the world. Write an essay in which you argue your position on the extent to which this claim is valid. You should use examples from Macbeth and any other Shakespearean work you've read, as well as from your own experiences and observations. So for your claim, if you remember back to last week's writing task, you can defend and agree with Mack's assertion. You can challenge or disagree with Max's assertion. You can also qualify, which means you might agree to a certain point or disagree to a certain point. Once you've constructed your claim, you will brainstorm and plan out the reasons, evidence, counterclaims, and refutations that you will use in your essay. Remember you want to use supporting reasons and evidence from Macbeth and any other Shakespearean work you can remember but you can also use your own experiences and observations to support your claim. If you need to revisit the summaries and lessons on Macbeth, make sure you take some time to do that so that you can gather reasons and specific details from the text to include in your argument. If you are using reasons and evidence from your own experiences and observations, ensure that you have specific examples you can include in your argument. You are free to choose any method of organization that will work best for you. You may want to use the classical argument style of organization that you've used in these past few weeks. You may want to generate an informal outline of bullet points, or you may want to create an organizer similar to the one shown here. Again, it is up to you to use the method of organization that will work best for you. After you've completed organizing your writing, you'll compose your rough draft. Remember, this is just a first draft, and you will have time in lesson two of this week to review your essay, make revisions, and complete a final draft. So at this point, we will take a look at lesson two so that you are prepared to complete the revision of your draft and turn in an outstanding end of unit essay. In lesson two, you will strengthen your writing by revising and editing your draft from lesson one in order to compose a final draft of your essay. You will reread the rough draft of your essay from lesson one, make some notes as you read to identify places you can revise and strengthen your writing. You'll use the rubric included in the lesson to help guide you in identifying areas for revision. So on the next slides, we'll take a close look at the rubric in lesson two, so that you clearly understand the expectations for a high scoring essay. You may want to take some notes so that you can refer to them when you get to lesson two later this week. What we see here is the first part of the rubric. We see that you are looking at standard 10.6 and what you need to show in order to show mastery of that standard is that you understand how Michael Mack developed purpose and point of view in the passage that we just reviewed from his essay. How would you do this? Well, as you're stating and developing your own claim, remember that you are doing so in response to Mac's central claim and reasons and evidence. Therefore, you will want to include the points he makes in your own essay. In your defense of Mac's points, your challenging or qualifying of them, you'll compose explanations that develop your own argument and also show that you accurately understand the point of view he develops in his essay. As we move on to the criteria for writing, to show mastery of the writing standard, you want to address the prompt by ensuring that your claim is in response to Mac's central claim, 
that through the reading of Shakespeare, individuals learn about themselves and the world. You'll also want to develop your claim by giving solid reasoning and specific details or examples from Macbeth and any other Shakespearean work you've read, as well as your own experiences and observations. And then you also want to ensure that your writing is organized, that the points are coherent and easy to follow. This is where your outline or organizer come in handy for logical organization. Don't forget to use transitional words and phrases to help your reader understand how the points that you make connect to one another. You also want to make sure that you're using a formal writing style for this task, as it is an academic paper. And finally, let's take a look at the criteria for language and conventions. Notice that for this part of the rubric, you either get one point or you don't. So let's make sure that you do what's expected in order to earn that point. Notice that the rubric describes meeting the standard as demonstrating command of the conventions of standard English at an appropriate level of complexity. So at the 10th grade level, you want to be sure that your subjects and verbs agree, that you're using a variety of sentence types, that you're using parallel structure where appropriate, and that you have punctuated your sentences properly. A comma where a comma belongs, correct use of semicolons, and a period at the end of each individual sentence. Notice also that while there may be errors here and there in mechanics and grammar, that your teacher would want to ensure that the meaning is generally clear. So any errors you might have should not impede understanding. After you've made notes on your rough draft in lesson two and identified opportunities for revision, you'll review the checklist you see here. This is also included in the materials in lesson two and is intended to help you make any additional notes on your rough draft as needed. Then, taking into consideration the notes you made on your rough draft, you'll compose a final draft of your end of unit argument essay, making the necessary revisions as you write. Well, that was your end of unit writing task. So congratulations on completing unit four. I know you've put a lot of thought and effort in over these last several weeks, and your teachers know that too. I'll see you again next week for our last week of lessons. Hello again, and welcome to lessons one and two, both the print and online version for the week of June 8th. I'm glad you were able to join us today. My name is Rachel Boisevich, and I'm so happy to be here with you. You might find it helpful if it is possible for you to have a piece of paper, a pen, or a computer to record your thoughts. If you don't have access to somewhere to record your thoughts, no worries, please just listen in today. By the end of this two-part lesson, you will be able to determine a central theme and trace its development over the course of the text, analyze the development of a complex character and the way in which that character advances the theme, analyze the cultural perspective of that character and the way in which that perspective is reflected in the novel or play, and compose a thesis statement and a body paragraph for an essay. Let's begin by thinking about the phrase colliding cultures. What does this mean to you? How can collisions call someone's identity into question? Consider the text you've read over the course of the school year. What text from over the course of the school year include a depiction of characters caught between colliding cultures? I know it's been a little while, so here's a quick review of the works you may have read in each unit. In Unit 1, you may have read Oedipus Rex, Julius Caesar, Macbeth, Things Fall Apart, variety of short stories or poetry. In Unit 2, you may have read works like Crime and Punishment, Cry the Beloved Country, Metamorphosis. In Unit 3, you may have read Night, In the Time of the Butterflies. You may have read Speeches or A Letter from Birmingham Jail. And throughout Unit 4, we've read a variety of works, mostly poetry, but a short story as well called The Lottery.
Take a moment to read over the prompt you will address in this lesson. What do you need to know? What do you need to be able to do? Did you notice that this prompt focuses on colliding cultures specifically with a character? And this collision causes the character to question their sense of identity. It affects them greatly. When choosing a work, we need to make sure the character's sense of identity is impacted by this collision. You're welcome to choose any work from over the course of the school year. What work that's best fits this? What else do you notice? Do you see that you are asked to think about the relevance to the work as a whole? This is theme. Be sure to make that connection to the author's message. Based on the prompt, what would you have to know and be able to do in order to be successful? Go ahead and take a minute and record your responses on either your packet sheet or in the digital version. You'll be moving to the planner response section in just a couple of minutes. Before we do that though, I'd like to take some time and do a quick review of textual evidence since this is so important for your body paragraph. I'm going to be using clips from the Collections Online Interactive Lesson on Textual Evidence. You have access to this as well, so you are welcome to log into Collections Online, visit Grade 10, and select Interactive Lessons. So, when we include textual evidence, do we know which method of textual evidence to use? There are advantages to each method of inserting textual evidence into your writing. Use a quotation when the author says something in an especially precise or original way. Use a paraphrase when you want to simply Simplify difficult content or summarize it so you can refer to it briefly. Use a summary when you want to convey a great deal of information in a short space. We can think of integrating quotations similar to a sandwich. Using a quotation effectively is like creating this sandwich. Your introduction to the quotation is the top slice of bread. The quotation sits between your words like the filling in the middle of the sandwich. The bottom slice of bread is your reflection or explanation of the quote's relevance to your paper. Let's take a look at an example for the introduction. Go ahead and read the provided example. What do you notice about the, how the quotation is introduced? Then we have the quotation. Go ahead and read the provided example. What do you notice about how the quotation is included? Is the quotation just dropped in? A quick note about including quotations. Set short quotations in quotation marks. 
For quotations longer than four lines of prose or three lines of poetry, use the block quotation format. Indent the entire quotation one inch from the margin. Do not use quotation marks. Add extra line spacing before and after the quotation. And end the sentence introducing the quotation with a colon. And then we have the reflection, which on the AP rubric is referred to as the commentary. Here's the most important part, the explanation of the significance of the textual evidence you have included. Let's move to the final point before you write, avoiding plagiarism. It's important to give credit where credit is due. For example, this short review is from the Collections Online Interactive Lesson on Textual Evidence. When you refer to someone else's ideas, you have to give that person credit. That is true even when you paraphrase or summarize another author's ideas. If you don't credit the author, you're implying that the ideas are your own. I hope that quick review on textual evidence was helpful. Now, I invite you to write your body paragraph. It'd be a great time for you to pause the video if you are able to. But if you're not able to, and have access to your collections anthology online, which you use during the school year, please feel free to go back through the interactive writing lesson on textual evidence at your own convenience. Okay, so you've written your thesis statement and body paragraph. The second lesson for this week has us revised for content. In a previous week's lesson, you explored the revised AP rubric for question three. Now, I invite you to revisit that rubric. You'll be revising the thesis and body paragraph based on that rubric. How does your response compare? In what areas did you excel? And in what areas might you need to improve? Let's take the thesis statement, for example. Do you present a defensible interpretation of the work? And for evidence and commentary, is your evidence specific? Does your commentary explain how the evidence supports that line of reasoning? And go ahead and take just a moment and reread the typical responses that earn four points section. Which leads us to our final section, sophistication. Do you explore the complexities within the selected works? Is your style vivid, persuasive? Now it's time to revise. You will notice, if you are following along, again in your print or digital version, that you have this organizer to double check your thesis statement and your body paragraph. For your essay, take a look at what you were asked to do. Then I invite you to reread your thesis and body paragraph and complete the evidence from my paper section and what I can add, remove, and change section based on what you've noticed.
Once you are ready, submit your final copy of your thesis statement and your body paragraph to your teacher. You did it. This concludes our work in Unit 4. Thanks for joining me today for Lessons 1 and 2 for the week of June 8th.